Hello, everyone. I'm Shpresa Halimi, Research Assistant Professor with the Institute for Sustainable Solutions, and I would like to welcome each and every one of you to our weekly seminar series. Uh, the title for tonight's talk is... Um, next slide, okay. <laughs> Grounding Sustainability, Place, Practice, and Perspective, and our tonight's speaker is Dr. Vivek Shandas from the... College of um, Urban Studies and Planning. Before I introduce uh, Dr. Shandas, I would like to make a couple of announcements. Um, after the talk, we'll have a brief time for um, questions. Please uh, come on up to the mic in the middle aisle. And we will have also um, a small reception following the lecture uh, so we can continue our discussion over refreshments. For students who are taking this course for credits, please come and see me after the talk. Uh, Dr. Vivek Shandas is an associate professor in the Tulan School of Urban Studies and Planning, a research associate in the Center for Urban Studies, and a fellow at the Institute for Sustainable Solutions at Portland State University. He teaches undergraduate and graduate courses in uh, participatory geographic information systems and environmental planning. As the founder of the newly established Sustaining Urban Places Research Lab, his team focuses on three sub, uh, substantive areas of investigation, examining feed, feedbacks between environmental change and human behavior, developing community-based indicators for measuring the social and environmental conditions, and uh, characterizing the relationship between urban development patterns and environmental quality. Prior to serving at Portland State University, he was a school teacher in Oregon, curriculum developer in California, and a health and environmental policy analyst for New York State Governor's Office. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Shandas. So I'm told I'm to stand at the mic. I, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty lively, uh, I think. I might be slow, but I'm lively when I, um, when I present, so I'll try not to veer too far from this mic. And had I known that this was going to be the size that it is, I would have double-checked for typos. So excuse any of those that you might find as I go through some of these slides. Um, but really, it's a privilege to kind of come here and talk to you a little bit about what we've been involved with over the past several months um, and in some cases even several years of trying to really synthesize and analyze and integrate several different streams and, and, and veins of investigation as well, as well as curricular activities and engagement efforts that we've been trying to uh, foster around sustainability. And, and um, I want to just start by kind of starting, uh, starting with a set of uh, propositions that I want to put, put forward to you. And, the first is that this notion of small change or specific small behaviors that we might, might be engaged with um, can have long-lasting implications on our ability to sustain the human populations. And this is this notion of kind of uh, accumulative effects, if you will, or a, a, a means by which small actions every day could, can add up, proposition one that I want to uh, start with. Second is that Understanding those slow, modulated fluctuations to our immediate environment is essential for sustainability. Not only actions for sustainability, but in fact, research that we do around sustainability. Um, third is, is that urban areas have often been described as problematic and as the problem to sustainability. And I want to propose that they are in fact a solution. And Fourth, that this, in, that this effort to engage across sectors uh, in solution-focused research can be essential and, in a sense, effective for addressing the large, complex, and wicked problems of society. And so this is, this is evoking, essentially, that universities are but one player in a much larger milieu of actors in this sustainability game. And I want to... I wanna, kind of really build off of this, this basic concept to try to think about 
uh, how we move towards sustainability in the, sh in the, short, in the little time that I, have, uh, that I have here. So as popularized in the press, Friedman and others have, have, have stated that what we need to solve these problems are new tools, new infrastructure, new ways of thinking, and new ways of collaborating with others. The stuff of great new industries and, the, uh, and of scientific breakthroughs. And so this question of new is, is something that I want to come back to, but um, the questions that I want to try to delve into a little bit today is really focuses around this concept of incremental change, and that is very seldom do we have a genuine understanding of how small changes that we make have scaling up impacts. And so the question that we could, propo pro that we could pose is, starting to look at what difference can incremental change in our individual behavior make for creating a sustainable future? Questions, um, other questions such as tools, what tools enable collective action for addressing current and future sustainability challenges? And finally, what's the role that technology and data play in our ability to identify effective solutions? So really trying to provide a pretty broad frame here to, and then start to get into some more specific details about what we're trying to do in addressing some of these questions. Um, so with that, with that um, part of the concern that I come here to you today with is the role that the university plays. Um, at one point in time, universities were probably the epicenter of a lot of the knowledge that we had about society, about the world, about the universe. Universities are increasingly um, becoming less and less that central node, and more and more are, do we have more and more we're needing to engage multiple sectors in any of these efforts around sustainability. So the current challenge is I would pose it to the sustainability efforts for a university in trying to address some of these questions are what I'm calling at least today the five D's, and that's not to equate it to a grade that we're giving. Uh, a university for their sustainability efforts. It is, it is really, there is still a lot of work to do, but there's a real um, disparate um, effort of research uh, uh, activities across campus. We're really finding that there are very specific research projects that are funded to do specific, to address specific questions for specific uh, funders and what have you. And that is a major challenge that we're faced with right now. Second, I would, uh, I would propose that we have uh, a real detachment of research and curriculum. And this is writ large. It might, there might be pockets of it where, there, there is in, in, where there's intimate integration, but right now a lot of the curriculum and a lot of the research is happening in separate domains. Um, third is this concept of disciplinary solutions and training. Often as in a school of urban studies and planning, I see the world as a concerned uh, a citizen, as a scholar, as a researcher, as a teacher, as a facilitator, as one, th as one through my lens of urban studies and planning. And that is what are the planning tools, what are the planning uh, 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 processes that can help us address these questions. Very disciplinary focus. A very uh, much more of a disciplinary silo in many respects, even in an interdisciplinary, so to speak, field of urban studies and planning. Um, uh, the, the fourth that I would touch on is this question of um, linking engagement of citizens, decision makers, and non-academic stakeholders. This is something we have whole centers on campus that, that attempt to enhance and encourage and foster this kind of engagement with non-academic organizations, but still relatively thin, relatively um, um, small in the, in the scale of how much engagement we can actually be doing as a, as a center of, of, of activity. And finally, needless to say, as I stand here without my red shirt on, there is a diminishing, concern, there's a diminishing kind of investment from the, from, from the state to the university, and so that puts, uh, that's puts researchers, students, administrators, et cetera, in a real challenging situation to try to figure out what resources can we have to address sustainability challenges. So here's, here's again, a, a, a kind of a set of challenges that we're faced with. Incremental to institutional, right? Incremental change of behavior of everyday life and institutional challenges that the university is faced with. So this is, this is the kind of uh, 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 framework that I want to start with. And so what, I, what this suggests to me and the work that we've been involved with is that there, there really needs to be a few, a, a few to begin with examples that offer solutions to better connect universities internally and across sectors. 
So how do we go about doing this? And I'm not going to propose that I have the solution for you today. You can all go home if that's what you were thinking. But I'd rather suggest just a, a, a means by which we can start to think about this and a, and a project we've started on that we believe has a lot of promise to addressing some of these challenges. Recently, the mayor of Portland developed a concept that was being applied in various parts of the country, the world, looking at eco-districts and or, or, or applying eco-districts. And so what we've, what we've started to do at PSU is try to cobble together a, an understanding of what an eco-district might be, what is it that it might offer, some of these five Ds, could, can the university respond using this particular framework to challenges that might be related to sustainability through this eco-district tool? And so what we, what we started to do with is essentially presented a, a, a proposal to ISS, which we subsequently followed up on in, around this collaboratory uh, this summer, that looked at three components. One was this education. How can we actually bring resources, identify curriculum that would be of direct interest to multiple sectors, that would be of direct interest to students, that links directly to research opportunities? Um, second, how do we bring a broad group of people together to um, address some of this, what, some of what we're calling this place-based agenda around eco-districts? And then third, what, uh, could we start to build a modeling infrastructure that helps us better integrate the disparate activities that are happening on campus around at aerosol and climate modeling or transportation modeling or uh, mo hydro hydrology and, and water modeling? Can we start to think about ways in which that, those modeling efforts can be uh, can those modeling efforts would help to uh, integrate the disparate activities on campus. Those were our three objectives, really, in this, in this effort to try to uh, suss, out, suss out some of these, the possibilities here. Um, and so in sum, what we can say from the work over the summer and, again, over the past several years is that this concept has really affected PSU in several ways, and I've identified three here. One is that it's really been an opportunity for PSU locally in many respects, um, and coming so soon after the Eco District Summit last week, it makes a lot of sense to even kind of propose this, this uh, role that PSU might play in Eco Districts. And first is the integration of data sets and disciplines. We've really brought together quite a few people around this topic and started to evaluate and assess what kinds of data might be linked to the decisions that are pressing for the eco districts of, of Portland, the five pilot eco districts of Portland that are currently underway. Um, second, it's been an opportunity for kind of uh, many researchers who have been working in their laboratories, very kind of insulated from a lot of the questions and actions that have been happening around the world, to directly link their data sets to what are concerns in neighborhoods and what are, what's happening in various parts of the city. So it's been a means by which this multi-sectoral in integration has, has, has started to happen. So Portland Sustainability Institute was one of the collaborators on this collaboratory along with the city of Portland. And what we were able to do is immediately have specific questions that the community members were asking us that we could actually uh, organize and integrate and provide to these, to these organizations. Again, a lot to be done still on that, but we've I feel like we've developed a, a, a model to be able to start having these channels for researchers to actually have implementation of some of their, some of their research results. And then finally, there's, there's a piece where students have, been into, students have been involved with this. There's a course this term that's focusing on eco-districts, I, I know. There are capstones that are emerging on eco-districts, and there are engagement efforts that are, that are um, moving forward on eco-districts, and, and, and certainly faculty that are increasingly interested in this concept as, as how they could play it out, not only in their research, but their um, um, education or curricular and service agendas as well. So it's really been an integrative concept, and, and, and what I want to do is kind of propose to you today that we've done a lot. And in fact, I've, the, this, nec uh, this next slide that I have kind of tries in the best way I could, think back since the inception of this concept of all the things that have been happening around PSU on eco districts uh, over a period of time. And I don't, I don't want to go through each one of these in detail, but I do want to try to identify the things that have occurred to our group when we started thinking about uh, eco districts around curriculum and research. And 
we found that um, there's been thought pieces that have been done on eco districts, um, such as um, the 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 what I what I uh, affectionately call the novella that Ethan Seltzer, Professor Ethan Seltzer in Urban Studies and Planning, uh, uh, championed. There's been surveys and outreach that has happened not only in the downtown neighborhood but in other areas around the city. Um, there have been a number of uh, um, kind of assessments of carbon and water and and air quality that have happened, um, biophysical research that's happened alongside the social research in these various parts of Portland, uh, in the Portland metropolitan region. So a number of things have happened in terms of uh, the actual activities on campus. We've been able to rely on a number of community partners who have been working on this to come and give guest lectures and to participate in various curricular um, um, means. And so this is, again, just a retrospective. And what I want to get into is where we're headed with this, where we're headed with this and how we can actually start to um, engage more people, engage people more deeply in trying to address some of the current, um, current challenges that we've identified in this, in this area. Um, so the three that I would want to spend a little time on today is really where we're headed, aspirational data, this idea that we want to link data to decisions and decisions to actions, and how do we start to engage researchers, community members, decision makers in this data question. A second piece is this concept of mediated modeling, which I'm going to come back to and I really think is the, is the backbone around which some of this, this is going to move forward, at least the way I can see it. Um, and then there are going to be select applications that we're going to see this playing out in, in terms of whether it's international applications that might happen in, in Vietnam or other, other, or other places around the world. There, there's emerging interest globally in this concept, and we're hoping to actually have select applications of what we're learning in this living laboratory as we can apply that across, more broadly across the planet. Um, so this, this, is where we're, this is kind of what we've done and the way that we've kind of thought about how to do this, and let me spend a minute on, on um, how we've gone about thinking of this, 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 this really complex concept of neighborhood scale sustainability. Um, this notion of place, grounding sustainability in place, practice and perspective about, uh, uh, really comes, resonates with many of us around this concept of neighborhood sustainability. And um, the way we've thought about it has, has been really first to understand what it is this eco district is about. So this concept of characterizing the social and environmental conditions in a district, um, and that has a lot to do with how much how much water are people using? What's the air quality here? What are the social perceptions of this place? Really characterizing the snapshot of what's happening now and 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 conceivably what's happened in the past. A characterization exercise. That um, the second step that we've that we've just started to. Um, um, engage with through some funding from um, National Science Foundation, U.S. Forest Service, and other organizations is to start to monitor various flows and fluctuations of resources within this district. And we've got neighborhoods that we've identified, which I'll get to in a minute, and w really asking some questions about what are the um, kind of continuous changes that happen, these incremental behaviors where there might be a really hot day how does that hot day or that pulse event have an effect on the way people behave in these neighborhoods and what's happening in these neighborhoods? Um, so that's one of the questions that uh, really is driving this monitoring, monitoring piece. And finally, where I'll spend a little bit of time today is how do we go about asking what if scenarios? So what if this neighborhood got a lot more dense, meaning we have greater numbers of people and buildings per square unit area? What would happen to the air quality? What would happen to the water quality? What would happen to various resources through this specific localized effect? How would that have ripple effects on other scales, possibly um, regional and, and, and national and potentially global? So starting to ask these what-if scenarios of um, and, and modeling allows us to start to think about that exercise in a, in a way where we don't have a crystal ball that we can go to and say, tell us what Portland will be like in 2030. So one approach and one tool that has shown a lot of promise is this concept of modeling and trying to ask what if, um, not only to a computer, in a sense, but to people. And that's what I want to, that's, that's, the t that's um, kind of the core of the argument that I'll be making in the, in the remainder of what I have, the, the time I have today. So 
we've done a lot with the top one. We've characterizing the region. We've we've been kind of uh, wallowing in data. We've we've started. I, I want to just give you a little primer on the first one before I get into the second and third. But the fir the first characterizing the system, the eco district was a really interesting concept for a lot of us because it wasn't a household level analysis. We weren't talking about necessarily just the individual behavior of whether I use my, the bus line near my house or not, nor were we talking about large scale regional uh, uh, air shed patterns that might affect how much nitrogen dioxide is in the air. It was this sweet spot, as we called it, this, this, this concept that we're, we're not quite thinking about uh, a, a, a regional, we're not quite thinking about an individual household, we're thinking of something in between. And when we scoured the literature this summer, a group of the researchers from multiple disciplines sat around for a week and scoured the literature, starting to think about, does neighborhood actually have some traction in terms of our ability to conduct any kind of modeling exercise, any kind of characterization or monitoring exercise? And really, it's, it's, it's pretty far, it's pretty, again, it's pretty thin we were finding a number of household surveys that were done that were then extrapolated to the whole region um, in terms of biogeochemical cycles, in terms of uh, specific uh, uh, energy use, et cetera. On the other hand, we were finding a lot of satellite imagery uh, um, and other means by which you could look at entire regions and, and, and climate models that were describing what was going on at this really meta scale. So we were kind of really puzzled by the fact that even though many, many researchers had spent time giving, um, giving a lot of attention to, the, to this, to this um, need for multi-scale analysis, we were finding a real uh, limited amount of, of empirical analysis that would suggest that um, we, we have this, so to speak, sweet spot. And so what we did was array what Portland Sustainability Institute had come up with in terms of a series of performance areas around air quality, uh, water, uh, access and mobility, uh, waste management. And we tried to array that according to what data we had available. And what we were finding is that it was all over the map. And we weren't able to um, find a lot of data that would necessarily fall into the sweet spot, the sweet green spot, if you will. Um, and so what we called that area is this aspirational data, where we have this meso-scale of an eco-district, um, thinking, again, regionally. And we're also thinking about getting empirical data, meaning um, um, data that of, of actual behaviors, of actual actions that people have taken. And so we called this aspirational in many respects. And when we arrayed the... Um, the performance areas across these simple two axes, we could find that there was a, a real disparity in what we what we could what would fall really right in this sweet spot of data, where we couldn't find necessarily very detailed data set empirical data sets on a variety of different uh, uh, performance areas, and so this 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 was an exercise for us to first say, okay, where are we right now in terms of our current understanding of the system? characterizing the system. And we, we came back to this, for, as researchers, we came back to this point of, wow, we're, we're, we got a lot of job security. Um, so what we, what we started to ask questions about is, why do we need these data? Where would they be of value? Who would want them? And that got us into kind of just putting all this together and trying to say, OK, what do we have across the city? Let's just lay it out. And so we laid out what data we have, for example, on water, which I'll get back to in a minute. So we looked, we talked to the wa uh, Portland Water Bureau. They were very generous, gave us lot, uh, household or parcel level data sets on, on water use throughout the city. And we, got, and we have this for Tualatin Valley, um, for city of Portland, and the, the, the surrounding region. We're able to kind of characterize at a very detailed level the amount of water use over the past 15 years at the household level every quarter and in some cases every 15 minutes. So a ridiculous amount of data in this case. And so the second, the second part was looking within some of these districts, these eco-districts, of seeing what the variability might look like within a district of water use. Just one example of water use of dark blue being highest water use and light blue uh, or greenish being um, uh, le uh, uh, relatively less water use. And we're seeing there's a lot of intra-neighborhood variability saying, wow, not only do we have a lot of variability across the entire city, we can say that there's a lot of variability within, within the neighborhood. 
um, again, characterizing the system, trying to get a snapshot of what's happening in each of these places around Portland. Um, then, we, then we engaged in a series of uh, exercises looking at, um, looking at the city from, from space, and we were able to kind of characterize what was going on at, at, in terms of the amount and distribution of vegetation in the city, and we were able to get a, a snapshot of what this downtown area of where you're sitting right now looks like in terms of um, vegetation, and as, as Posey was referring to this as a surrogate for habitat. Um, we, we were able to set up a series of monitors around the region to look at carbon dioxide fluxes. This is actual ambient levels of carbon dioxide in the air. These were some physicists that were involved in this work to actually look at an, an urban scale, and I, I, would, I would argue a neighborhood scale, um, level of carbon dioxide fluxes throughout, at least in this case, three areas in the city. Um, in Salvi Island, which was really working as a control area for us, um, a, a kind of modestly developed uh, area in southeast Portland and a, a downtown area of, of, of PSU. And we can look at this over summer and we can see this, this diurnal cycle over time and see that there are ebbs and flows and those spikes that you see are, are, are calibration errors, not, not um, a, million, uh, a million parts per million of carbon dioxide. Um, so, so again, trying to characterize what is it this place looks like and trying to get a sense for, for where we live um, from, from, again, a very kind of clinical data perspective. Um, we can do the same for model, model data that we find on air quality, and we can see w the air we breathe across the region, and we've got um, a lot of, a lot of uh, detailed um, modeling work that the Department of Environmental Quality, who we've been working with on this, have, have provided to us, and we've been able to kind of look at how this overlays with our districts and what kind of air quality might be in these districts. And so, so, so here we have it, a set of data that are, that are kind of all disparately, disparately generated and trying to bring that together in what we, what we called, at least at the beginning of this collaboratory, um, ADEPT, which is a database Portland um, for eco district, a database for eco districts of Portland, um, where we are trying to integrate and, com and, and organize and then ultimately communicate some of this information out to the, um, out to the uh, uh, primarily decision makers as it was set up um, now. So we were, again, trying to get stakeholders involved. We, we developed with Posey a website that hosted all of this data. So if there was somebody in Lentz, somebody in in, in Gateway, somebody in, um, in, in uh, downtown or Lloyd, South Waterfront, you could go to your specific neighborhood, you could identify a specific area, you could look at what your air quality was like, you could look at what your um, um, water use was like, you could, you could identify transit use in your neighborhood, et cetera, et cetera. We, we, we essentially synthesized a lot of this and organized it in such a way where we could have quick access to it. Um, again, not as a decision-making uh, not, not solely as a decision-making exercise, but as a means for having, starting a conversation, um, which, is, which is where I kind of want to go next, this, this role of, okay, we can keep digging this hole with data and get h better quality, higher resolution, more, uh, more expansive data sets. So what? What do we do with that? Where can we go with that? And that's where this, this backbone of, of mediated modeling has started to uh, rear its oh-so-pretty uh, head, let's just say. Um, so the, the conceptual challenge that we're faced with, because we can, as researchers, just gather data and put it out there. We've got dozens of websites, which I'll show you in a minute, that have done precisely this, a huge data organization and collection exercise and serving it up, right? Lovely, useful, necessary. Where it gets really interesting is when we start thinking about this as a conceptual challenge of, so what? We have lots of data. Does that automatically mean decisions are going to be made in the way that would lead to sustainable futures? Doubt it. So here's, here's, here's one proposal, a conceptual challenge. And what I want to start with is what we do in many respects. We have mediated discussions that, that essentially bring people together, this would be quadrant D. So if you look at this, this would be essentially the up and down is changes to a place for convenience sake, just changes that are happening to a place, whether a place is shrinking like Dresden or Berlin or whether a place is growing like Portland or Bangalore. Um, and then on the, on the 
kind of xy, if you will, I'm sorry, on the x-axis, if you will, or this uh, side to side, you have the degree of engagement that's currently, uh, or a degree of engagement, either low or high. And in, and in many respects, we have trim planning has, the field of planning has tremendous experience in, in, in mediated discussions, in bringing people together around workshops to, to identify specific goals, to identify consensus. And we've, we've, we've been doing this for, for some time. And it's often mandated by law. So there are a lot of institutional drivers that are requiring this mediated discussion to happen. OK. Where we are in many respects is C, which I would call this quadrant, where there's a low level of, of change that's happening and low level of participation that might be happening. And conceptually, this is the idea of a status quo where there's a confrontational debate about this Walmart going into my neighborhood, I don't want it, I don't want it, I don't want it. Challenge, challenges to economic development in areas and confrontational debate and no, no change, no improvement in a sense in terms of at least our sustain, in some of the measures of sustainability that we might consider. Um, the, the third piece is where a lot of the, mo lot of the efforts around sustainability, let me, let me bite my tongue on that one. Um, many, of the mo many of the efforts around sustainability have have really tried to identify through expert applications sp specialized knowledge that would be generated and identify what a sustainable future might look like. And these are often data intensive exercises that would identify an ideal and then oops, identify an ideal and move towards that ideal, a target if you will, and move towards that ideal through very specialized, often technical exercises. That's, that's, that's what I would, in this conceptual challenge, refer to as, a, as an expert application. Where we're going with a lot of this is trying to, again, link people, place, and perspective, which is trying to find ways where the, the data and the understanding we have about a place can, be, can work together with an engaged exercise where people come together to actually discuss uh, what they want to see about that place, what they value about that place, and where they'd like this place to go. So as places change, to actually engage people in such a way that's both grounded in their experience and perspective of the place, but yet uh, um, linked to the knowledge systems that we have in terms of our data, in terms of our data, to be able to help to inform some of what's going on in that place. So this is where we're trying to go with with some of our exercise, and this isn't an easy. This is not by any means an easy. Uh, uh, an easy sell. If if you all think this this is this is easy easy breezy, then I'm I'm gonna uh, begin with a conversation about um, what we're trying to do when we're navigating what I would call this upstream this upstream challenge in research, where we're going from often a set of concepts that we we could propose and how it's essentially done often in a downstream approach where we have a research agenda that looks at patents around technology, that looks at equilibrium and efficiency, that looks at impact and expert-driven orientation, that's, that's a mass balance equation that is a, a, about optimizing an individual system. Um, often the investments are money, and, and ultimately what we're trying to temper is urbanization. This is what, this is what a, Lisa would refer to as a downstream approach. And where we're trying to go with this is Again, not that this, not to disparage this or to belittle this in any way. These are essential. These are these are real. These are useful approaches. Where it gets a little bit more hairy is when we start moving upstream a little bit and start thinking about concepts of community values that come into play when that's the objective. Concepts of sufficiency and needs that are uh, that are part of this community. Concepts of citizen-driven and participatory processes that are that are integral to the methods that we use, concepts of um, integrated systems, which I'll get come back to in a minute. Um, time is a big issue in the, uh, uh, as we've thought about in terms of investments. And then ultimately, as, as many of us have been in the, immersed in the literature on sustainability and, and sustainable cities, this is something that comes up over and over again and the human ecology interactions. So this navigating research and, and curriculum um, and more broadly engagement efforts upstream is by no means uh, uh, an agenda that I have any direct uh, solutions for, but what I would like to do is at least begin with a, a kind of an overview of what's, what's, state of the, what's state of the science 
in terms of trying to understand the, the way the university has played a role in navigating our research curriculum and engagement efforts upstream. Where have universities, uh, what have universities done? And when we did a survey of a number of the centers at universities that tried to bring together people and data, we were finding a real mixed bag of what was out there. We looked at uh, about a dozen, um, with the help from academic research computing, we looked at a, a, about a dozen of these centers around the country. And um, we were asking ourselves, to what extent are current research efforts in integrating people, place, and perspective? And trying to get a sense for what is it that these centers are doing to try to bring stakeholders together, to bring data together, to really dance. Lots of them, lots of them out there, varying forms, varying um, scales. And what we're seeing is things like the decisions, decision cent, um, theater in Arizona State University, um, Center for Environmental Visualization, just up the road here at University of Washington. These are these are like um, uh, these are these are these are very um, um, these are becoming very common, let's say, at universities uh, um, in in many respects. And what we are finding is a lot of challenge in terms of how people were actually part of this exercise. Lots of data. Again, I can go down a data hole and spend a lot of time down there generating data and analyzing data, serving up data. But when we simply ask the question of how much is this grounded in place, how much, does, how much do, do people participate in some of these centers, what we are finding is a, to a very limited extent. Often they were the consumers of expert knowledge, and often they were the kind of responders to expert knowledge, as opposed to people who were participating in, knowledge, in the knowledge system itself. So that was, that was one of the conclusions that we came to. And so what we're trying to do then here in Portland and where, I, where we believe we would have through the summer uh, collaboratory exercise, where we believe we'd have a lot more traction in terms of what we do well here in Portland State is to try to move from these mediated discussions into these areas where we can start to engage people and data. So really, and this is where the concept of grounding sustainability comes from for me, is this idea of trying to, uh, use what we know about the place and what, uh, what we know about the place from agency-derived information, if you will, with community-based information and local knowledge about what's happening in that place. Um, so let me, let me just run through a little case study here. just want to give you a short little example of what I might be talking about, how we could potentially move forward on this. And the case study is something uh, that I talked about earlier in terms of data sets that we have around uh, that are that are that are super that are super detailed, very informative, and in this case, it's water use. And I want to just this is a collaboration we've been having with the Water Bureau for quite some time here. And what we wanted to know is a variety of things of how land use patterns affect water use, and uh, um, and and what this particular discussion that I want to just touch on is this example where we're trying to identify mechanisms where we can scale water use. So how does individual household water use behavior scale to neighborhood? scale to uh, city, scale to region? That was one of the questions that we wanted to get at. Visualize water use behavior across space and time, which I'll show you a little video in a minute of trying to think, think about that. And then uh, trying to develop predictive scenarios for what might happen in 2020 when all of Arizona moves into Oregon. And we're going to be pr uh, so hard pressed with not only housing people, but potentially water challenges. And so thinking about various changes in land use technology behavior and price as it affects some of these um, water use water use variables. Um, when we look at Portland, we can find neighborhoods, one neighborhood that has high water use right next to one that has very low water use. We're scratching our heads because it turns out those neighborhoods are about the same year, those households are about the same year. There's things going on in that neighborhood. They have uh, uh, differences in, in, in number of uh, people possibly per household that could affect how much water is being used in each of these. But again, right next to each other, and we started scratching our heads at this micro scale, this parcel scale, if you will, how much water was being used. And we found that there's a lot of disparity within one neighborhood. Again, this theme of intra-neighborhood um, differences comes up over and over and over again. Um, uh, from, from space, these, these neighborhoods look um, remarkably similar. And so we want to drill into this a little bit more and start to ask questions that have, that have to do with how, what are the determinants of this difference in water use in this neighborhood? 
what might be driving this difference? And what we are finding is that one thing that's at the regional scale, this is again the kind of daisy chaining of data, if you will, uh, from regional to very localized impacts, is we're finding that temperature, um, one of the examples in a paper that we have out in Journal of Climate and Water suggests that temperature, believe it or not, affects water use. Can you believe it? And what, what was more, what was particularly, I think, novel about this was that we were able to not only find specific um, um, thresholds or specific points at which temperature uh, was affecting water use, but how that varied according to household size as well as, to a certain extent, the age of the household. And so we were, we were kind of scratching our heads and saying temperature doesn't affect all in all the same way. It has varying, it has varying impacts across the region. And so this got us thinking about um, what, is the, what is the regional scale water use? What could the footprint look like? And we started, we, 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 we've started to look at what, what the density, what the average home age, what varying behavioral and population and technology parameters within, a, within this area might look like. And here are two examples, one being the average um, age of homes in Portland, um, broken out by census, uh, broken out by a grid cell, if you will, and then um, also trying to look at uh, the, the built environment density or, or essentially um, floor area ratio, if you will, trying to think about how dense specific areas in the region might be because we know those two things affect water use along with the number of people, the pricing, and the technology in, in, these, in these areas. Um, so given that we've been able to isolate a data-driven exercise on this particular concept, what, we, what we've done now with, with this uh, simulation or this modeling approach from a data perspective is start to develop some scenarios where we're saying temperature has an effect on different buildings in different ways. We have water being affected by those structures. We have uh, varying climate scenarios that might affect um, the, the development patterns and the behavioral response and ultimately what would happen in terms of the, the water in a household, in a neighborhood, in a city, in a region. And so let me, let me um, kind of segue from there into a attempt to try to visualize some of this. So what we're, what we're doing is trying to take data that we've been processing and working with for a long time and put this into a visual platform that w could start to help generate conversation about what's going on in this place. And what we've used is a very... Um, is, is, a, is, is what I'll call a straightforward, a very straightforward modeling platform called NetLogo to try to bring together this, this very rich data set that we had on just one concept of water use. And we can talk about air and energy and transit um, uh, later. But what we were able to do is just take this one concept and develop a proof of concept, if you will, for water use. And so let me, I'm going to just uh, go through a short little video here to, that, that begins to describe what we might see, a 20 second video, what we might see in terms of uh, the water use in one neighborhood of Southeast Portland known as Foster Green or Lentz, um, which is again one of these eco districts that we've, that we've identified. Hmm. Oh, there we go. Okay. So here's a, here's a little window, of just a patch of an area, if you will, of the city. We know every household ha uses a specific amount of water, and we've simulated that water use over, uh, over a year, over several years, and over decades. And we're both looking at this not only from a neighborhood scale, but we're looking at this from a temporal or decadal scale. And we can actually downscale using a number of... Um, data models that have been downscaled from climate, we can say what the temperature, plus or minus a fair bit, is going to be like on May, on, on uh, November 9th, 2020, use the downscaled climate models, at least the best, uh, 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 best estimates that we have, and look at how water use would change at this neighborhood scale. And so what this is a depiction of is essentially both it's kind of a visualization as well as you'll see some color changes in some of these households, and that essentially is a time-based change in water use based on a number of these determinants around temperature, um, um, housing size, and um, housing size and uh, weekend or weekday. So 
again, just a fly through of a neighborhood, trying to get a sense for how these different, different houses, simulated houses might change according to different time periods during the day and different time periods at night, um, time periods during the weekend. So our, our hope is to try to take this specific neighborhood, link it to what's going on in a quadrant of southeast, link that to what's going on from a data perspective to what's going on in the city and the region, and to actually start examining what the differences are between one neighborhood and another and use that in a mean, as a means for engaging citizens within these areas around what could be potentially conservation behaviors with water use. So this is, this is again, one, one very uh, kind of beta model that we wanted to start with to see if it's a proof of concept that we have any traction of. And I'd welcome, in fact, one of the, the, the modeler who's been here um, sitting, uh, sitting quietly in the front, Michael Weisdorf, has been, uh, in, is, a, is a graduate student in the system science program who's been uh, intimately involved in the development of this model and trying to actually work with these multiple data sets and, and visualization platforms. And we're trying to see how we can integrate the water with the energy, with the scales, with the time. So again, this qu question of integration comes up over and over. Um, for, the sake of, for the sake of trying to move along, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go through this next piece somewhat fast because all I've talked about so far is data. We've been engaged in a whole series of exercises trying whole series of exercises trying to get a uh, perspective as well. And just in a, a couple of minutes, I want to go through this, this last bit of the, the remarks that I have for you today, and that is thinking about, you've seen the video, thinking about what about perspective? Again, working with some uh, savvy computer um, um, platform designers, we were able to work with a small group of students to develop a platform that allows them to go out into a community and ask, the, ask this community a series of questions about their place. We, in this case, we asked a series of questions about, very general questions about what places they want to see stay the same in this neighborhood. This, again, is this Lentz Foster Green neighborhood. What places they want to see change. And each of these icons represent those different questions. And what people are essentially doing is putting points on a map. And we can download all those points, analyze those, and evaluate what the perspectives are on, of those different places in the neighborhood. And what we found was remarkable consensus around this particular place. And the next series of slides that I'll go through relatively fast uh, show at one event, these students were able to go through and generate several dozen um, um, responses in a very short period of time about perspective of place that we then brought back to the community to ask them why, what, how, and in starting to engage them in a conversation. And so, for example, one of the things that came up was what are the places you want to see stay, what are the places you want to see stay the same? And what we were able to do is kind of put, create these hot spot maps where the darker red areas are areas of consensus and the lighter blue areas are places where people did not uh, either respond or there was very little consensus. And so we could identify places people wanted to stay exactly the same in this exercise, places, places people identified that they'd like to see change, in this case, 82nd Avenue and Foster Road. Um, uh, places where they, they were, uh, the way the students had posed the question was places they wanted to, where they connected with people, where places, of conven co places where convening was happening. And, and finally, just we have a whole series of these that I don't, don't want to get into, um, but uh, suffice to say that w we, we were able to start to generate perspectives if you will, about this place. And so what this has all got us thinking about, and this is, this is the kind of kickoff event, if you will, is starting to think about how do we bring all these data sets, all these perspectives into an integrated fashion that allows us to look at things across scales and allows the university to be a convener and organizer for these types of events. And what we've, what we've started to work on is the Center for Integrated Multiscale Modeling, which is essentially a... Uh, an emerging center that attempts to use on the right side, if you will, a real uh, time, uh, 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 I'm sorry, a real data driven uh, exercise of water use in this case. We're going to link those with a several other data sets that we have with these, with these kind of integrated mediated modeling um, workshops that allow people to come together to link both data and perspective around particular places in this region. And w um, so we've, we're, we're kind of moving along um, swimmingly with this particular center right now with a lot of help from the Institute of Sustainable Solutions. And what we're, what we're essentially looking to you for is help. 
and help in a variety of different ways. And researchers can help uh, with, with this center. This is not an individual exercise, not my exercise. It's a very collective exercise. It's, it's attempting to try to bring together. We need researchers, uh, students, postdocs, staff, um, um, and, and faculty to really uh, help us with data sets and database systems. That's a big part of this is this notion of a portal. Another part is visualization platforms. We, we, we really could use, we, we, we'd really like to help build that piece of this so that we can engage people in, in direct and, and meaningful ways. And then finally, we want to develop a series of interactive exercises that would help us engage these people in meaningful ways over time. Um, so there's a set of research questions there. There's a whole series of case studies that are happening in our backyard that, that it'd be great if we could get a better sense from practitioners on the ground, including community members, about what might be those multi-scale challenges people are faced with right now that would help us engage people in that community, but yet bring, if you will, the horsepower of the university to the table. Um, and of course, the community members, there's a, a whole series of ways community members can participate um, although for the time being and staging this kind of carefully out, we want to uh, kind of start with a series of pilot workshops that would happen this winter and spring that would bring researchers together with community members and, and decision makers and private, public, and NGO sectors to start identifying what might be case studies that we could run a few of these exercises with. Um, so again, this is this is a progress. This is a work in progress, and I just want to conclude with. Um, the, the, the idea that this is something that PSU might have a very strong, not only has a strong reputation for this engaged effort, but increasingly so has a direct link to a lot of the research and data enterprise act, en enterprises that we've been involved with for some time. So to bring those together would be a, would be a, a, a timely event that we could actually help to, uh, help to foster, and, and your help could certainly move this along in many different ways. Um, so with that, I want to kind of just leave you with a, a simple, um, leave you with a simple quote um, by a complex person. And um, there are a couple of places where you can go for additional um, information about this uh, center that we're starting to develop and ways in which that you can actually participate. We'll be looking to you for participation in a variety of different ways, and I'd really uh, want this to be as much of a collaborative effort as possible. There are several students involved with this already, um, and what we're looking for is a number of faculty members across the university to engage in this effort. Um, so with that, I'll, I'm going to leave... Uh, I'm going to leave at least this microphone and kind of open it up to general discussion questions if, if, if you're still awake. All right. So um, earlier in your presentation, I thought where you were going to be going was towards a little bit more conversation about kind of a communication strategy and engagement around taking all this data and maybe making it more relevant to a larger audience. Um, where does that fit into what you're trying to do here? Um, f a communication strategy. So, so what part of part of what we're trying to do is. It develop means by which we can bring people together to talk about a place. And so there's a, I, 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 it's not an area that I'm familiar with in terms of trying to develop a, a series of communication strategies that would enable us to necessarily engage uh, the, the, the stakeholders that are involved. But what I could speak to more specifically is this, is this area of how to actually bring people together to define problems that might be relevant in, in a place. What we've found in just a few of the pilot exercises that we've done, again, in workshop settings in the region, are that many of the problems that people identify often um, are assumed. And what we're, what we're finding is when we start to bring information about various data sets, whether it be about water use, whether it be about density, whether it be about air quality, to these, uh, to these uh, workshops and these, these events, 
we're finding that there's a very disparate set of understandings of what's happening in this place in terms of change over time, in terms of quality of the environment. Um, so what, what the angle we're taking with it, at least, and again, this is, a, this is an emerging exercise, if you will, the angle we're taking is essentially to, to um, engage, people in, engage people in these kind of problem-based and, and ultimately solutions-oriented uh, uh, kind of workshops that allow us to start to bring data to the table and, and use data as a rhetorical device, if you will, as a rhetorical tool to start the conversation, as opposed to saying, this is what your place is, this is what your place will forever be and actually start to say what might be the interaction between the social perceptions of this place and what we know about what's um, environmentally occurring in this place. And so that, that, that's a, I, I don't know if that's getting at your question necessarily um, as, as, you, as you would have liked, um, but to, to, try to, to, try to, bring, to try to bring together this, this data and social, and social perceptions Data's, data on social perceptions of place and uh, environmental um, um, conditions so that there's a conversation that can, th th we can start a conversation. So uh, again, I don't, I don't quite know if I'm getting your question in terms of communication strategies, but I'd be open to talking with you afterwards. Hi, Wayne. So, so what, what might be a, I'm Wayne Wakeland in, in system science as well, what might be a burning question, the kind of question that keeps people up at night that we could use these approaches to try to make a difference in, in around sustainability, of course, but what, what, in a neighborhood, at the community level, at, a, at an eco-district, what would be a burning question as an example? Um, say a little bit more burning question in terms of what would a make A burning this question is something that if we can't figure this out, People are going to really hurt, you know, or, or the situation is going to get, get a lot worse. You have a neighborhood. Maybe it's, uh, you know, we, we can't provide quality water based on projections of water availability. or You know, I'm just trying to – how do you make this more urgent, more mm, more something you can sink your teeth into? It seemed pretty kind of general and abstract. And, like, what – how would you put a headline up on there or something like that? Oh, interesting. Yeah, that's going to take some thought. <laughs> a headline. Um, um yeah, that that that's a that's a that's a hardball. That is tricky because in part what 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 this is is an an a call to action for a university to try to play a role in the broader sustainability efforts that are out there, a means by which interdisciplinary actions can take place and a means by which a university can be a convening a neutral convening place for various discussions. Again, um Part of the call to action is there f is then for the university. Part of it is the continuous status quo that we're faced with in terms of uh, whether it be experts making decisions about a place that are affecting individuals or whether it be about no change, no interaction, no engagement happening and a continuous uh, a confrontational outcome that maintains the status quo over time. So in a way, it, it, it's timely in the sense that once – there's, uh, I guess, I guess, I guess I could take it in, in one one sense. If if there's a recognition that there is a problem, then there then we can point to ways in which these solutions can start to can start to um, provide direction for 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 uh, not only individual places but then how those places are connected to broader um, the broader city, the region, the planet. Um, Hmm. I'll have to think about the actual headline or the or the thing that would keep uh, it keeps me up at night thinking about it institutionally. I can tell you that much. Um, how to actually enable a university to work across multiple disciplines to really foster the kind of data-driven, community-engaged exercise that I'm talking about. That's that's far from a trivial exercise. Even though it may be written about and talked about um, kind of theoretically a lot, we're 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 ambitiously trying to uh, explore whether this has any traction here. So again, it's a start. We've we've done our homework and looking at where others are trying stuff like this, and we're not seeing it. And we want to try to see what we could do here. I'll leave it at that. See, back a question from online. Um, I think it's. Um, asking basically what the community members' experience might be like participating, whether they would go to a website or 
Would it be a mobile device? Would they be physically in person around a table? What would that look like? That user experience look like? Yeah, right now it's primarily set up. And again, this is the f this is literally the the fourth month of this, maybe the third month of this. Um, in terms of it, the thinking, and so there's no doubt a lot more work that we want to do with it. In terms of the immediate exercises that uh, uh, that um, few of us have been thinking about, it's primarily through workshops that will be broadly advertised um, and um, surveys that we would really welcome participation in at, at this stage. So it's, it's really around kind of uh, a series of uh, small steps, pilot examples, if you will, to try to um, tease out some of the exercises that we want to, to kind of uh, roll out, if you will, across the city. Um, because this is, this is kind of precarious ground, trying to bring data together with people and trying to generate a conversation or communication strategies that might, uh, that might deeply and uh, broadly engage, engage community members. Um, you said something, hello? Yeah. Hi, you said something earlier that was kind of, you just said it offhand, but you said, what are we going to do when the entire state of Arizona moves to Portland? Mm. Um, and that, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about maybe the tensions that might exist between uh, maybe solutions that um, address these really serious problems that are going to happen with climate change and everything that may not, that may be at odds with what community members want if, if in a truly participatory, you know, like, resident-driven process. So I just wanted to hear more about what you meant and then maybe tensions that you could envision with that. Sure, sure. Um, so I'll start, I'll start um, that, so the anecdote about uh, the Oregonian had, this is, these are the headline kinds of things that I'm not, I'm not savvy at developing, but uh, Oregonian had this uh, headlines a couple of years ago that, were, that was around, you know, the, 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 uh, the drought that started that a number of scholars have identified that started in the southwest is really taking its toll and how that could really lead to severe shortages in Arizona in terms of water. We've seen a number of shortages, literal, literally cities uh, drying out, if you will, in many parts of the country, including more, most recently in North Carolina. Um, what, so so what, what that means for people's mobility and especially those who have choice and where, they, where they're able to go. Um, and, and, and in terms of the tensions, the things that come up often are, or at least often, the, the examples, the anecdotal example I can bring is we had a group of workshop students in our urban studies and planning master's program go out to a community in Gateway. And they were all geared up with data and raring to go, and they came out to this group and said, here's what your air quality looks like. Here's what's going on in terms of your water use. Here's where um, climate change and urban heat islands might impact your community. Blank stares, not really much going on in terms of how the data were received, how the engagement was um, the engagement moved forward. And so what they ended up doing as an exercise, a six-month exercise, they stepped back and engaged as we slowly kind of, in, as we slowly um, kind of worked together on this of, of starting where the community is and starting where the perspectives from which the community is coming to the table and then trying to build from that the relevant and, and, and uh, specific data sets that might be relevant to the, that might be directly uh, linked to the problems they're describing. Um, so the tensions that had come up are often around, we want, I mean, at least in the examples, the anecdotal examples we can say so far is that we want, we have very clear ideas of what the problems are in our neighborhood, in our place. And we want to find ways to be able to, um, we want to find ways to be able to address those problems in meaningful and effective ways. And the question for us as a university is, we can l leave it to Posey, we can leave it to a number of other organizations that are actively involved in community organizing for these communities um, and leave that be as, as, as in and of itself. And um, the concern I have is often that uh, decisions that are made are about that specific place with little, with little or limited under, uh, understanding or acknowledgement of how that could ripple out to other parts of the region or other parts of the planet. Simple example is the question of, that happened several uh, years ago of the Northwest Climate, uh, Northwest uh, Forest Plan, where we had set up large, which was a very effective and 
uh, um, uh, politically uh, contentious uh, issue that was part of that that was rolling out during the first Bush era um, around uh, the spotted owl trying to draw lines at, to uh, protect specific forests. What ended up happening was a lot of forests were conserved in the Northwest. That was in, a, in logging the globe, which was uh, which is a book that was documenting this very carefully. A lot of that was displaced to other parts of the world. So if we take for example, that kind of idea and apply it to a community context, what are the ripple effects and the tensions that might be apparent in one community that could potentially spill out to affecting other, other communities around, around the city? So, that, so I guess I would take that as, take that as one, one way of describing the, uh, the tension that might play out from a local to a uh, regional or global um, impact. I'm uh, wondering if anybody in this uh, related to this effort uh, has considered uh, examining uh, or reviewing uh, community newspapers over over six months a year uh, as a way to identify what issues are that uh, that are concerned to people repeatedly and have some uh, have some uh, uh, expertise uh, or have already drawn some. Uh, response from experts or community experts at any at any rate. That's a good. That's that's interesting. We haven't we haven't done that. We 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 have a communications department on campus. They've there are scholars in the in the field of media studies around. I think this would be something that we would we would want to get. I mean, the idea is to get a, a part of what I'm understanding is we want to get a pulse of what's happening in a place. And there, Portland has got a lot of very active neighborhood associations. A lot of active. Uh, uh, newspapers that are uh, that are directly linked to these neighborhood associations. So the question is, what information, what from for us, I guess, or for me, what information, what pulse could we pick up on if we were to evaluate what's happening in that community over six months? And I suspect we could get a, a, a lot of uh, rich information about what's happening in a place, and then what are the ways in which our our research, our data, our engagement efforts can help to address some of those challenges. So yeah, I mean, I think it's a, I think it's a brilliant idea. It'd be, it'd be important to get the, those, those skills, those people with those skills, to be able to do that. One of the concerns that comes up for me is this working? Yes, great. Um, is what you offer to individuals if they help, if mm. they bring you data. Because so far, the topics you've brought up are not the kinds of things that keep people up at night. Mm -hmm. Or even people necessarily worry very much about their water consumption. They worry about their water bill. So finding ways to make those things concrete to mm -hmm. residents would probably be a, a good way of looking at it, as well as, yeah, I think when you use the verb convening, you're offer you are asking for people to share power in it. What power are you going to offer? Hmm. Yeah. Um, so I was at a, so last week, part of a uh, n uh, National Oceanic Atmospheric Administration funded project on comparing water use in Phoenix and, and Portland, we convened a series of water, water managers. And I'm speaking anecdotally, but again, a lot of this is based on kind of a, a, a general sense, a general kind of uh, uh, or a systematic review of what's out there right now and experiences that many of us have had who are immersed in data exercises. And um, we convened this group of people just right here at University Place. People had come up from, uh, come from all around the region. These are people who essentially make decisions on water, everything related to water, how much water we're going to be able to sell to the Sunrise Water Authority from Portland Water Bureau perspective, how much Hag Lake over in the west side will be part of our water uh, supply system, whether we need a, another reservoir. A lot of these questions were of immediate interest to the decision makers. And what was interesting about bringing these people together in this meeting is we were essentially sharing our perspectives of what we had learned, not only through a survey that we'd conducted, but also through a series of 
um, modeling efforts that, not to get into details or the technical aspects of it, but microclimatology models of looking at how changes in climate might affect demand, water demand, in these different parts. And when we kind of engaged them in a conversation, they told us where they were coming from, what their co specific concerns were. What was remarkable is almost unequivocally the water managers were, um, were, were amazed that this was a convening agenda around, with no, this was a convening uh, um, a forum with no agenda. In, in the sense that we did, we weren't trying to sell them something. We weren't trying to engage. We weren't trying to um, ask them to link their effort, their data sets to our data sets or anything like that at this stage. And to have that kind of a forum, that 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 kind of power, uh, that kind of a, a place where the power, the power, if you will, is is about conversation, is about what we learn when we conduct the research. We were finding that there was a tremendous receptivity by these water managers to actually start to engage in the data, engage in the discussion, and try to actually start having conversations between the water managers who were there, who never talked to the land use planners, and actually starting to say, what if we were to actually develop MOUs that would start to help us understand better how land use patterns affect water demand? And so what we were able to do is start, because Again, we were in the status quo where land use planners, again, anecdotally, were talking to themselves, water managers were talking to themselves, and just through bringing this short little bit of data to them through a series of questions and over the last two years, um, there, we, were, we were astonished at how much of that kind of status quo was actually able to be questioned. And I think that's where we, I think that's in terms of the power sharing and the kind of bigger capital P power I, I'm not getting into, but the, but the ability to actually start a conversation in a neutral forum, or at least a, quote, neutral forum is where we started. Yeah? My question is not about people who are already within, who already are creating. Yeah. My question is about people who Gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah, that is, we haven't touched on that yet. We haven't gotten into how this is a, how this would be of direct, for community organizers, for example. Um, that's an area we have so far um, kind of, we're right now still thinking about that is all I can say. Um, it's not something that is something we want to do um, very fast or very furiously. We want to, that, that's a very sensitive area that we want to be very careful and deliberate with. Um, so, so at this stage, it's, we're at the stage of kind of get, convening the university and the researchers in the university. A, a few small institutions that might actually be of direct and uh, of interest to to this to this effort, and then potentially over the second year, third year, and fourth years, we're hoping to expand it into something that might be of direct relevance to community members. Because as being on a board of several organizations, I, uh, at least community-based organizations, I know that there's things that the university can do that we can do that would be of direct uh, of interest to them. And, and, and I'm speaking mainly from a data, but also from an engagement and, and kind of convening perspective. All right, am I off the hook yet? I think you are. Okay, good. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. So Vivek teaches a class at 640. Uh, maybe we have five more minutes to kind of, okay. if you would like to come and over and talk to him. Otherwise, thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs>